Shane. Uh, Colin, when I last saw him in hospital, mischievously produced a portrait of a Portuguese grandee with an enormous beard, armored breastplate, feathered helmet, and a pike in his hand, and hounds at his heels. This was a 17th century owner of an elaborate Palladian villa in Portugal, shown in ragged pages torn from a country life. These pages uh, transfixed us. This was both a salute and a reminder of his deep love. He could hardly speak from his stroke. I also was speechless. In that moment, he transported me back from his sick bed through many years of our relationship. <clears throat> I had last seen a grandee like this one, who so excited Colin in Washington, some 30 years before in Colin's Renwick Place house. This house was a memory palace, a treasure house in the museum tradition of Sir John Soane's house in London. Like Soane's house, to enter this house was to enter a temple of memory of infinite dimensions, a collage of modernist and traditional objects, uh, and uh, objets d'art, sorry. Following admission to the studio, it was one of the rituals that one day he would be summoned to the house. To be entertained for drinks was one of the rites of passage which many of us have enjoyed, not without a touch of initial terror. Colin's rooms, which everyone has talked about, furnished with the two leather Chesterfields, Victorian mechanical furniture, the marble top table, thonnet chairs, two elegiac uh, pastoral rosatively oil paintings, the prints, everything. These would provide the setting for this ritual, which marked a certain point in your education. A degree of acceptance was implied, before Colin's mysterious process of polishing and trimming propel propelled you to graduation and on to a professional life. Besides his famous lectures and his studio presence, Colin's personal and individual attention to his students' education was legendary. In the course of my visit, Colin proposed with a grin that my beard must go. A shocking proposition to a young, uh, very nervous ex-hippie. <coughs> Realizing all of a sudden that this was not about to happen, he then changed his tactics, prompting his rapid disappearance into the library. In Renwick Place, Colin's library was housed in a separate cube room, across from the fireplace, entered by two symmetrically placed sliding doors. This was a perfect Renaissance scholar's study, like uh, that engraved by Dürer to illustrate uh, the scholar's uh, melancholy isolation. Of course, Colin used it for many other purposes. But returning from the library, Colin proudly produced a book of portraits with uh, his grandee as a sweet argument that the beard could almost be all right. Actually, if it was more magnificent, more truly splendid, then it would be really okay. Perhaps uh, he brought out uh, Titian's portrait of uh, Federico Gonzaga, the fifth marquis and first Duke of Mantua. I hope so. It was Giulio Romano's patron. It might have been. Uh, but I remember that this humanist prince was a, was a spectacular creature, engaging the world, all belts, breastplates, rapiers, and feathered hat, uh, with a decoration that reached a sublime crescendo on his armored codpiece. Uh, I didn't know what to say. The comparison was meant as a compliment. And yet the prince was also a surreal symbol of the frailty and vanity of humanity, the futility and yet necessity of high ambition. In the hospital that day, Colin took me right back to our laughter at the hubris of this proud figure and the joy of that encounter. At the top of the stairs in Renwick Place, Colin kept Le Corbusier's sketch of a Janus-headed Medusa son with snakes for hair. And this I always read as a mark of his critical humanism. This symbolic presence, both smiling and crying, was a constant reminder of the ambiguity and fragmentation of the world, as well as, well as a reflection of a sense of its inner unity. Hidden in Colin's extensive library at the house was a slim, dark blue volume by Ernst Cassirer on the Cambridge Neoplatonists, 1928. This small volume, a relic of Colin's early student days, described a group of proto-modern scholars caught on the cusp between the medieval and Renaissance periods. Their intelligence allowed them neither to believe in the old alchemy 
nor trust the new science. Instead, they founded their stoic calm and equanimity on a faith in the creative ability and inventiveness of the human intellect. This was the unfailing fountain of their inspiration in the face of the tumultuous changes of their world. Colin undoubtedly worshipped at this same fountain, drawing his friends and students into its sphere, sharing the radiance. There he staged his epic battles between Apollo and Dionysus, the gods of reason and pleasure, often with unpredictable results. But Colin will surely be remembered by we who love him and by the larger world as one of the most powerful teachers and architectural intellects of the last half of the 20th century. <laughs>